Hello, dear listeners and viewers. My name is Christy Brown Montesano, Chair of Music History at the Colburn School. And I'm here with Scott St. John, violinist and Colburn's Director of Chamber Music, and special guest Estelle Choi, cellist with the Calador Quartet. Last week, we started our program with a brief statement about the Black Lives Matter movement and our hope that we in the Colburn School can do our part to battle the abhorrent and enduring racism in our country. One week has not dimmed the sense of outrage and the need for action. As educators, we know that change and growth begin with our own ability to listen, reflect, and crucially to take action in our lives, our classrooms, and our institutions. Equity, inclusion, and diversity values that we hold dear require an open dialogue between every level of an organization, as well as with our students and the community at large. This is not a process of a few weeks, just during a clear crisis, but a commitment that must be taken seriously and renewed constantly. So in this spirit of community, we welcome you to the fifth episode of Colburn School's live stream series, A Serving of Beethoven Lunchtime Concerts. A Serving of Beethoven, which we will carefully plate every Thursday at noon for the next few weeks, is one of many ways that the school hopes will keep us Colburn connected with the performing arts and with each other. One benefit of the online platform for a serving of Beethoven lunchtime concerts is that it offers our viewers and listeners the chance to engage with us directly by asking questions. You can ask us about Beethoven or the programmed quartet, or you can pose a question directly to our guest artist. Such a Estelle is here with us and she could talk about her experiences with this particular quartet, also as a member of a professional quartet and what that's like in the world today. Just post your questions in the comment section of our live stream on the Colburn School Facebook page. So Scott, could you formally introduce Estelle and also tell us about today's quartet, which I should add, Beethoven himself identi identified as his personal favorite. Yes, yes. Thank you, Christy. Uh, today we'll be hearing Beethoven String Quartet Opus 131, originally performed back in October during our Beethoven 250 Festival. Uh, Colburn was immersed in Beethoven for a week that was built around the String Quartet cycle. We celebrated Beethoven's 250th birthday and also honored our longtime faculty legend, Arnold Steinhardt. Now, roughly half of the quartets in the cycle were played by the Calador Quartet, and they are really a Colburn School success story. The quartet was founded at Colburn in 2010 and features both Jeffrey Myers and Ryan Meehan on violin, Jeremy Berry on viola, and of course, Estelle Choi on cello. So the Calidors have now played all over the world, and I'm so delighted that we're joined today by the Calidors cellist and a fellow Canadian, Estelle Choi. <laughs> so welcome, Estelle. Hi. Hey, great to see everyone. So it's it's hard to believe that I, I've known you, I think, for over a decade. Um, but uh, before before we talk Beethoven, um, maybe just uh, tell us a little bit about how your quartet has been managing uh, during this pandemic. Yes, well, um, I guess now we're in about month three and um, we're slowly trickling back to New York City. Uh, we haven't really been rehearsing in the last three months um, and that's been that's been tough uh, especially having just spent 10 years of our lives <laughs> virtually spending every single day together mm -hmm. um, so it's been a very uh, very long break for us um, but we're really excited um, we have a couple of concerts coming up in july which we're getting ready to prep for um, and yeah by the end of the month i think everybody will be back in the epicenter of the virus, <laughs> which is getting much better with every day that passes. Um, yeah. And yeah, I think we're gonna get back at it. Actually, I think we have some more Beethoven on the programs uh, in July. Yeah. Are the concerts you're talking about, are these uh, like live with audience? Uh... These will be, I believe one of them is without an audience, but will be live streamed at the venue. And uh -huh. that's gonna be in, um, uh, slightly north of Manhattan in Katona at the Caramore. 
uh, Center Great. of Arts. And then the other one will be in Chatham, which is a little further north. Um, and that's an outdoor venue. And so they're going to be limiting the number of audience members um, for Great. the concert itself. So today's Opus 131 Quartet of Beethoven is probably on many people's lists as most powerful, most emotional string quartet, um, even amid all these fabulous Beethoven quartets. So um, can you share maybe what, what makes this 131 quartet so appealing to you and to the Calidors? Um, uh, for me personally, it has to do with the journey that you take from the very beginning mm -hmm. to the end. Uh, this is a true representation of the spectrum from which Beethoven draws in terms of human emotion. Uh, in a lot of ways, I find this particular piece a little difficult to verbalize um, because I think it means different things to different people. Um, you can interpret the different elements, the shifts of the emotions. Um, they're so nuanced. Um, and yet so human. Um, so going from starting to the end without any real breaks, um, you really feel like you're being pulled on this incredible uh, journey of, of shifting landscapes. Um, how he goes from incredibly melancholic uh, to almost comical in the Presta movement. Mm -hmm. um, and then the way he wraps it up at the end um, with it's almost like death knocking at the door, um, fate uh, kind of standing by, reminding you uh, it's still there. Um, and so I always feel emotionally drained after playing um, after playing this piece. Um, and it's such a it's such a jewel um, what he's really left uh, for us. And with all of this quarantining, I, I have to say I have such a tremendous um appreciation and uh for what music can give to you um when you're not able to be around people it does sound certainly that when beethoven was writing this piece he he was also in a very you know kind of confined place in his in his head basically um do you think that that uh, i mean for you know, for for the seven movements of, of Opus 131, which is by itself a very unusual thing. Um, I guess I always think of, the, of that middle, you know, the kind of the crazy variations or the, uh, you know, the fact that he goes to kind of extreme lengths with the variation. Um, I don't know, do you feel like there there is a kind of emotional center that, that way to the movement or like, do you, yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Um, one thing that Beethoven does like no other is the bridging of old and new, um, mm. to think of how innovative he was, um, but at the same time, how he draws these kind of ancient music styles into and puts his own spin on it, um, especially in, in those variation movements. Um, it's astounding. Uh, to kind of feel that push and pull and how it unifies to become something completely unique. Um, and that movement, I do believe, is, is kind of the center, uh, just the way that he manipulates this one theme over and over and over and transforms it into these incredible, incredibly different um, scenarios and different landscapes. Um, as a as a quartet player, what do you, what do you think actually the most like challenging part of of one thirty one would be? Um, I think it's a couple of things. Um, well, first and foremost, I think it's the endurance uh, yeah. and the concentration because you don't have the traditional moment of okay, you can shake out your shoulder, turn the page, <laughs> let the audience cough. Hopefully, not cough too much. Um, and then kind of resituate yourself. In this case, it's just like, as soon as that first note starts, you're going and there's no stopping. Um, so I think that is something you need to work up to. Uh, and Beethoven in general requires a tremendous amount of concentration. Um, I think because it's also in each of the voices um, so equally shared in terms of the amount of the, the notes, the melodic sharing, um, the rhythmic intricacy. So you can't 
like doze off for a second. And that's what was interesting about the Beethoven Festival. Um, and we had been, as a quartet, kind of amping ourselves up to it because it's really difficult to do a whole program of Beethoven, as I'm sure you know, Scott. Um, it takes a different kind of stamina. Um, and so a piece like this is no different. Um, and then the other thing is really capturing those quick shifts of uh, character and emotion. Um, you have to be able to kind of completely swap out the different masks um, and throw yourself into um, a totally different landscape at the drop of a hat. Um, yeah, so I would say those are, those are kind of the challenging aspects about a piece like this. Yeah, that's great. We have a question actually oh, yeah. from one of our listeners. Uh, so this is for Estelle. Oh. Um, your quartet has been on hiatus, and in addition to COVID-19 disruptions, we now have major social justice issues to face. As a professional musician, how are you, and maybe the quartet as a group too, thinking about your role in this complicated world? Um, yeah, it's been a real period of uh, reflection. Uh, to have to suddenly stop doing what you love and what you've worked your entire lives to do. Um, and then to have the uncertainty of the future um, ahead of us uh, has, been, has been difficult. And perhaps a silver lining is the fact that people are, are standing up to what are such clear injustices that are happening in our society. And um, I think watching uh, my friends and um, watching people really stand up and say something about it has been incredibly inspiring. And it's caused, I think, everybody in this country to rethink how, how you treat others and how you view others and how you contribute either positively or negatively um, to uh, your society. And uh, this I think has been a really great time for the, not great time, but um, it's, it makes sense for the kind of apex of this to be happening right now um, mm -hmm. because we have this time, this time that, you know, we're not jumping on planes and uh, we're right. not dumping things out in a hotel room um, and then running off to grab a meal right before the concert. Um, so I'm very grateful uh, to be able to educate myself on what's happening right now. Um, and uh, of course, and encourage everyone to do the same um, because it's really important. Yeah, that, that is really true, this idea of having weirdly time to do things, right? Because we've been stopped in our tracks, our wild, crazy. And uh, I would say among the most kind of uh, speedy roller coaster lives you can ask for is a traveling quartet group, right? It's, it's a constantly on the run, constantly catching that thing, practicing, getting to, you're all over the world. And so, yeah, even that has this time, it's very true that when we've lived those lives to suddenly have ourselves go pause, put, push the pause button, mm -hmm. um, and it does offer us a unique opportunity about this. Um, I was thinking, we just have a few more minutes here and I'll see if any questions come up, but this uh, idea of the central movement, I mean, in case for people who may just be tuning in with us now, we're talking about the unusual structure of Opus 131, which again, Beethoven himself said, probably my favorite. Um, he began writing it at a weird time. Uh, he was making that decision about whether to detach the Grosse Fuge. Um, so he was in the middle of that. And then this is when his nephew attempted suicide. And so all his plans for how Carl and the relationship, and, and for those of you who don't know, he, um, you know, he forced a custody bottle for his nephew. His nephew now in his early 20s and a, a very, uh, difficult moment, um, and we can th you can think the ir the um, unreliability of nineteenth early nineteenth century firearms for the fact that he lived, um, and so this was a huge time of also for Beethoven a sense of what now of sadness of loss 
of, uh, of a reckoning with himself. And he had begun writing some of these bits already. He said, oh, I started to sh shove these into the Galitzin quartets, but in the end he said, doesn't fit. So he had these and he goes back to Bach and he studies the WTC, you know, and he really, so it is a kind of back to rudiments, back to introspective. We talk about these quartets being both public, but also very introspective. And this idea of the central movement being the heart of Opus 131, um, he often makes his slow movements that, and whenever he's doing variations, that was a musical process that was very dear to his heart as a natural improv improviser. Uh, Beethoven was an amazing talent at improv uh, improvisation on the piano. And I feel you really do get to see Be who Beethoven is in many ways in that central movement, as well as the fugue and, and all of those, but that it really does have that. So I hope our listeners will be taking in that special, this, this seven movement marathon. <laughs> Not all of them are equal, some of them very tiny, so that, but that you as a quartet have to stay focused. There's no break. And you're really having to show different aspects. It's also not just one flavor. It's lots of things being said, lots of proposals to your listeners. Um, and we have to go on that ride as well, right? So listeners are being asked for a kind of attention and stamina that we often don't associate with classical music. At least I find they want to, you know, many of us listen, many people listen for just the pleasure, diversion. But uh, this this is a quartet, I don't know, Estelle and Scott, what you think. It's a quartet that asks something a little different from its listeners. Would, would you agree? Would you, are there aspects of this because it's so long and uninterrupted and variegated? Yeah, I definitely think that it's, that it's a powerful statement. Um, and, and what Estelle has already said, I, I completely agree with, you know, it requires, and what you're saying as well, Christy, like, uh, you know, it requires a real commitment, not only from the playing perspective, but also mentally. Yeah. And, um, and I think from the very opening, you know, the kind of the mysterious way that it, that it opens also really draw, draws you in. Absolutely. Um, but Estelle, do you, do you have any last thoughts about, uh, about one thirty one before we go to broadcast. Oh gosh, um, I, I I'm excited to to see it again because it's been a while. Um, I hope that we achieve the things that uh, we set out to do. Um, I remember this being a fantastic performance. Though. Yes, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> it, it was one of the ones that that moves your heart deeply oh. and your mind deeply, like both. It's uh, it. Yeah, we're very excited. We do have one last thing, which I think we could probably close with. Uh, it's a question um, that I think is really pertinent to the larger, like the, the life of this particular series, but performing arts in general. Uh, the question is, will virtual performances remain as a mainstay of music appreciation once concert going is back to normal? And that's in quotes, back to normal. So we have just a minute here maybe to offer quick thoughts for now. We can continue with comments on the feed. Well, I think it's opened up uh, a whole new arena of how to enjoy music. Uh, certainly right now it's one of the only ways, but uh, my hope is that in the future it, it supplements what we do now. Um, I don't think it will ever replicate the real life experience, um, but uh, just as uh, your series is showing, uh, I think it can bring a lot of comfort to people um, to be able to explore these works. Um, and in some ways, you know, not have to get all dolled up to go to the hall. Um, you can enjoy <laughs> it from your kitchen, from your living room, wherever you are. Um, so I think the, the creativity that um, this whole pandemic has spawned uh, will, will live on, absolutely, um, with the hope that the real life experience will also come back. <laughs> Scott, any last thoughts? Uh, no, I, I agree. I mean, I have to say as a performer, I, I really, I, I can't wait to get back to the actual in-person music making. And I, I hope that that audiences will also want that that experience. Um, but there's no question that, yeah, this, this whole time is making us uh, 
you know, branch out in really interesting ways. And it is fascinating to see what's, uh, what's possible online. So, yeah, I think we will see people experiment now and hopefully it will give us not one or the other, but both, right. That we'll see the most of the best of both. So I want to thank um, everyone who posted questions and comments. And as usual, we will continue to engage with your comments and questions during the performance. So keep the conversation going. Uh, we will also add comments throughout the performance, observations about the various movements and stylistic elements. So you can take a peek at that as you listen. And of course, we encourage you to join us again next Thursday at noon for another lunchtime serving of Beethoven. Next week, we'll be back to early period Beethoven with two of the Opus 18 quartets, uh, the Opus 18 number two, played by the Calidor, and the Opus 18 number three, played by Colburn students Galia Kastner, Evan Johansson, Johanna Nowick, and Stephen Perkins. But now, let's hear Beethoven's Opus 131 quartet with the Calidor Quartet, and this is from Zipper Hall at the Colburn School in downtown Los Angeles.
Wow. Oh, oh man. That was incredible. Oh, exhilarating. Um, oh my goodness. Wow. Thank you so much to Estelle and all of the Calador members for sharing your astounding artistry with us. And especially this thrilling and I found deeply moving performance of Opus 131. Please uh, join us next week, Thursday at noon, for another live chat and a performance of two of the Opus 18 quartets. Opus 18 number two with our Calador Quartet and Opus 18 number three played by some fabulous Colburn Conservatory students. So from, uh, from all of us, see you soon. Bye. <laughs>